and title this message today, Victory Through Faith. Victory Through Faith. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say, Though the grace, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Father, we come before you at this special time in the service. We're asking you, Lord, for the anointing to come, to rest upon me as the speaker, that your words go forth and not mine. Lord, that you touch each and every hearer today. And Lord, that they would receive from you what you have for them in this message. Lord, and we ask you for physical strength for everyone. Continue the miracles of healing that you're working amongst us. And we'll glorify you in all of it. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. How do we come to that place of being saved today? How do we come there? How do we get there? How is our sin removed? And then what empowers us to live this Christian life? Well, brother and sister, it's all done by, in, and through faith. Faith. Something inside of us makes us to know when we've made that walk of repentance and confession. We've been contrite before the Lord. We've petitioned Him. We've asked Him to take our sins away. Something inside us helps us to know that it's real and that it's happened. Can I get a witness on that? Well, that's faith that does that. It's that faith inside of you that the Holy Ghost uses to trigger you and let you know that you're, that you're saved. Many people have come to me in time of battle, in a time of difficulty, and they said, Brother Bill, I just don't know if I'm saved or not. I just don't know if I'm saved or not. Because many times, many times, we're so comforted by our, the feelings that we have when faith is active in our life, that at any time when that feeling isn't there, we begin to doubt the humanness of us. We begin to doubt whether or not we're saved or not. Brother and sister, we're, we're saved by faith. We're saved by grace. We're saved by the mighty working hand of God. And we won't, I, I just, I hate to say this, but you won't always feel saved. Especially after you just got angry at somebody that cut you off in traffic. <laughs> and a little of that old carnal nature flares up. Or, or other many things that I could mention and I could bring before you. Think about, think about how God... loves us enough and I say more than enough really to give us this inner peace this inner comfort through faith knowing that when we ask all of our sin was forgiven hello when, when God called me to the altar I was the worst sinner in the crowd. I was probably the worst sinner on the face of the earth that day. According to what the preacher preached that morning I was. But when I humbly came before God and admitted that I was a sinner, admitted that I, I was a failure in all my own efforts to be good, and I called upon the gift given to me on Calvary's cross, something inside of me changed. And I knew that I knew that I knew that none of my past sins were accounted to me any longer. Amen. Brother and sister, I 
I, I found freedom at the altar of repentance. And I knew I was free. I have been digging and I have been in the Word of God so much in the past few days. God has given me extra time to read and study while I'm healing and while I'm getting stronger. I've been taking advantage of that. One of the things that I've been looking into and I'm curious about. I've been taught all my life, my Christian life that is, I've been taught that there's such a thing as generational curses. I've been taught that. Well, let me tell you something. Hold on to your seat. The first mention of generational curses is in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 5. Where, where God tells Moses that the sins of the fathers will visit the children under the third and the fourth generation unto them that hate me. I'm a purist. I believe we ought to get all of our answers from the Word of God. I believe we should get every one of our answers from the Word of God. So, if I went to that altar and all of my sins were washed away, there's no curse on me anymore. And we don't see the idea of generational curses being renewed on the saints anywhere in the New Testament. Come on, church, let's get happy. You know, sometimes we can believe something and we can teach something all of our life and think we're teaching the right thing, only, only maybe, maybe we're just teaching the popular thing. We're passing on what we've learned. We're passing on what we've heard. Jesus said on the cross, one of his seven sayings on the cross was, It is finished. Yes. And the, the, the curse of sin was overcome. The whole curse was overcome. Don't ever leave off those words on the end of Deuteronomy that says to them that hate me. It doesn't say that those sins are going to be visited on those that love me. It doesn't say it's going to be visited on the ones that serve me. It doesn't say it's going to be visited on the ones that stand for righteousness and do their best to walk hand in hand with God with the help of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Come on, church! Yes, amen. We're preaching about victory today. I hope that you'll take what I've said this morning and you'll get in the Word and you'll dig like I've been digging and you'll get a hold of that thing and you'll finally tell the old devil, hey, you can't come against me with this weapon anymore because I don't hate God, I love God. You can't come this any way anymore because I'm covered in the blood of the Lamb that cleanses me from all sin and washes me from all unrighteousness. Somebody get happy. This is a Pentecostal church. Glory! You know, I was made new! Made new! We see a lot of folks these days that claim to be Christians, claim to be believers, but there's nothing new in their life. They keep the same old habits, the same old vocabulary. Oh, help me, Jesus Stay off of that soapbox. Hallelujah. They carry the same old grudges. Come on. We are made new by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's act like it. Amen. Amen. Let's act like it. Because we've been cleansed from everything. There's nothing in the record. Nothing in the record except what we bring up when we share with one another <laughs> or when we chew the cud, rehearse, nurse our curse. Amen. You know, I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings in 1902. <laughs> but get over it! Put it under the blood! Yeah. Quit giving your victory away! Yeah. Rise up in faith and claim what is yours through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the presence of the Almighty in your everyday walk as you live a joyous, victorious life in our Jesus Christ. 
your faith? Your face? <laughs> Hello? So why is victory so hard to find in the church today? <clears throat> Did you know that for the past 10 years, the church as a whole in America has been on the decline? Fewer and fewer people are going to church. There are entire ideologies going around teaching and preaching that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I love you, but I'm going to tell you point blank. That ideology is not from God. Not going to church doesn't bring glory to God in any way, form, or fashion. It doesn't spread the gospel it does not lift up the saints. It does not edify the saints. It does not educate the saints. I know I stand out on an island by myself and very, very few people agree with me. People even cite things so foolishly. Well, look at the thief on the cross. He didn't go to church. Don't you know that the church wasn't established yet when the thief was hanging on the cross. Don't you understand that God had not poured out the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost until after that event? Why is church being ignored? I'll tell you why. I'm going to give you a list here. Fear, depression, sickness, disease, infirmity, pain, remorse, doubt, want, These are all features and problems and life trials that are far too rampant in the church today. Doesn't the scripture say we're more than conquerors? So why can't we conquer fear? Why can't we conquer depression? Why can't we conquer sickness, disease, infirmity, pain, remorse, doubt, and want. You see, all of these things are not coming to the church from God. They're coming from our enemy, Satan. Can I get a witness? We all know John 10.10, 10, don't we? Around here, it's one of our favorite verses. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Amen? But then there's a, 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 another punctuation. Amen? That colon is there and then what happens? I am come that they might have life. Can I put the word victory in there? Yes. I am come that they might have victory, they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. That more is stuck in there. That is not a, a proper way to say it in English language, is it? So we have to go back and look at it in the original language. And it means that, it, that, that you will have abundance at such a level that it will run over. That you can't contain it. Amen. Come on, church. Satan is the thief in this scripture. Got that? He's the thief. So who is he? Really? Who is Satan really? Well, we know. Well, let's look at the scripture. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou 
cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend up to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He's Lucifer. Lucifer, a defrocked, fallen, cast out angel. John 12, 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Satan is known as the prince of the air, the prince of the world. John 14, 30. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Get a hold of that. Jesus said that Lucifer has nothing in him. Amen. There are no connections. There are no similarities. There's no equality. <clears throat> Woo. John 16, 11. John 16, 11. Of judgment. Because the prince of this world is judged. Judged is a past tense word. Get a hold of that. And then Ephesians 2 2. Ephesians 2 2. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In the children of disobedience. Remember back in Deuteronomy, that line was in there of them that hate me. And now in this, in the, in the judgment time, when, when people are now coming before the Lord, that this spirit works in the children of disobedience. So that means that if your spirit is akin and right with God's spirit, the Holy Ghost, then the enemy, the prince and the power of the earth, has no part in he has no place in you. Now I want to ask you something. And I'm not going to take the time this morning to go into all of these details because there's so many words here that you have to follow out. But I'm going to use the English parts of this to the best of my ability. I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you want to write these questions down and work on them later, this will be a great time for you to grow spiritually. Where in the scripture do we find that Satan can be in all places at the same time? That's omnipresent. I'll tell you that in my search and my study of God's word, and now for over 50 years I've been studying God's word. I'm still a student, but I'm still studying. Because I took it to heart. One of the first things my pastor taught me was study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed. And so I'm still working because I don't want to be ashamed. Mostly I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. Folks, I haven't found a single reference in Old or New Testament that tells me that Lucifer or any angel is omnipresent. I only find that characteristic attached to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. Alright, number two question number two. Where do we find that Satan is all knowing? I was reading a book the other day. Someone loaned me a book and told me to read it. 
I enjoyed reading it. In fact, I've had several of you hand me books here lately. You want to make sure I didn't get bored, and I appreciate it. I had been bored. I have. I, I, I'll tell you. Look, when, when you when you when you pray and ask the Holy Ghost to lead you, when you read your Bible, you learn something, right? Well, do the same thing when you read something else. I do. If Satan is not omnipresent, that means there's only one of him. Hello? Have any of y'all in your in your past ever been involved in a, 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 a little fisticuffs? Now I'm gonna keep it on the I want to keep it on the on the playground level. I don't want to get this up to World War II and three and four. I just I learned something real early as a sinner boy. If you was going to pick a fight with somebody, get them when they're alone. Don't pick a fight with somebody when they got their buddies with them. Now let's apply that lesson, that crude carnal lesson. Let's apply that to our spiritual walk of faith. So if you're saying, Brother Bill, don't pick a fight with the devil when he's got his helpers with you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's only one of him. And you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost on your side. Yes. So anytime he comes against you, he's coming against a stacked situation. He's coming against a situation he cannot prevail in. Unless we let him. Woo, come on, church. He is not all-knowing. No angel is all-knowing. If angels were all-knowing, then the angel would know exactly when it's time to go blow the trumpet, but he doesn't know. Amen? He has to wait for God to tell it. And think about this. If the angels that are still in good standing with God don't know everything, then what makes you think someone that's been kicked out and defrocked knows everything? And I'm going to say this. Satan knows nothing about you unless you speak it into existence. Or act it into existence. Hello? You say, well, if he's not everywhere all the time, how come he knows when I mess up? Remember that when he was forcefully removed from heaven, from God's holy ground, he was cast to the earth. Amen? Along with a third of the angels that were duped, they were calmed, they were fooled into following him. Now we don't know actual numbers here. We just don't. But I know and you know that these evil spirits are moving around, going everywhere they can, trying to get something on you and something on me so that they can come against us and indirectly so they can come against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Satan doesn't want you because he loves you. Satan wants you because he wants to, to hold you up in the face of Jesus as a failure and show Jesus that his grace is not sufficient. But I love that scripture that says, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. And it's that same word more I told you about before. That means that grace is filling you up and running over more than you can contain grace. If you come and confess, there's nothing that God won't forgive you of and cleanse you up and set you free and make you new. And give you victory. Amen. Now, where do we find in this question three? Where do we find in the Bible that Satan is all powerful? That's omnipotent. Omnipotent is how other people pronounce it. I pronounce it differently. 
Sister Nancy corrects me each time I do, but that's okay. We, we, we all can have our little quirks, can't we? I mean, when, when we go to Arizona, people in Arizona, they're, they're all the time saying, you're from Texas, aren't you? <laughs> well, I sure am. How y'all doing? How'd y'all know I was from Texas? I wasn't born in Texas. I just got here as quick as I could. You see, the Bible is actually silent. There's not one word. But Satan has come through our times, through our generations, all the way from Adam and Eve down to today, and he is putting up a false picture of himself. Hollywood gives evil spirits all this amazing power and strength. But it's not true, church. Do you know that everything that comes out of Hollywood is fake? Those guys that play Superman, they keep lying. And Matt Dillon was not really a good shot. You see, our enemy is not what is what is said about him. Our faith can bring us to that place that we realize. We know he's just he's just a fallen angel, defrocked, dethroned. And when Jesus hung on that cross and died, the whole earth shook. It wasn't just because Jesus died, it was because Satan's kingdom was torn apart. His kingdom was destroyed for everyone, for every whosoever that will come and confess and accept and repent and then live for Jesus. I have spent too much of my Christian life living for Bill Sanders. I need to live more for Jesus. I need to give him more love and attention, time, dedication. I know I don't fit in everywhere all the time. But folks, I don't care. As long as I can make my father sitting on the throne in heaven and his son Jesus Christ to crack a smile at me. Because I'm walking in the place they would have me to walk. That's more important than any man's pat on the back. Or any accolades. Or any words that come. So why do we treat Satan like he's something he's not? You do not have to fear him. You do not have to cower, wondering what's going to happen next. You don't have to live a life of dread. So many Christians today look at their world and their time and their life from the negative aspect. Come on, church, I know what I'm talking about. Nancy and I have been through so many things the last 10 years. And either one of us can say, why me? Why me? And while I was laying there after my heart surgery, all I could do was pray. All I could do was fellowship with the Lord. And I came to that place of closeness in the Lord. I actually said, why not me? You promised me, God, you wouldn't put anything on me that was more than I was able to bear. And brother and sister, I know that I know that I know that those many people that I prayed for, it made a difference in their life. I don't have facts to put up here before you. I don't have 
list to put up here before you. I can't parade thousands by you to testify. It doesn't matter. I know it in my spirit because the Holy Ghost confirms it in my spirit. Yes. My faith tells me it's true. Yeah. Doesn't the word tell us that if one sinner repents, that the angels in heaven rejoice? One, one. So that tells us the value of one sinner in the eyes of God. One sinner. I want to remind you about one more thing about the devil. John 8, 44. John 8, 44. <clears throat> you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. There is no truth in him. That's the devil, Satan, Lucifer. There's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. <laughs> Satan tells you not saved, he's lying. Yes, Satan tells you you're not going to get healed, he's lying. Satan tells you you're nobody and you're not important and nobody cares about you, he's lying. Amen. Nobody likes a liar. And how do you treat a liar when they've been revealed? You call them to the issue. You bring out the facts. So today, this time, this message, I'm going to declare to you that we get our victory through faith because every born again believer has more power than the enemy. Amen. Hello. John, first John 4 4. You are of God, little children, and you've overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You see, health, peace, joy, and love are promised by God, the creator of everything, to all believers. Amen? Amen. You know, we live in a generation. Now, the now thing. We analyze everything. We analyze everything. And we, we don't even realize that in our act of analyzing, we are running ourselves through one filter, our own. Come on, church. Amen. When we stepped into this year, we stepped into this year declaring that we were going to ask God to fill us all with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I have preached sermon after sermon after sermon. We're teaching on Wednesday night about the Holy Ghost, who He is, how He works, what He does, and how He manifests Himself. We're just now getting on Wednesday night in the manifestation. And oh, we're having such a great time learning this. You see, brother and sister, God doesn't want you to try and fight this fight by yourself. He has supplied you a comforter, another filter, another set of eyes that know the perfect will of God so that you can come to a place of complete and full victory. Church, how many of you would like more victory in your life today? Let me see you. I, I, I do. I do. God knew. Our victory 
has already been fully delivered to us. All we need to do is open our arms and embrace our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit, His Word, and each other as we fight the good fight of faith and win and win and win and win and win. Nothing the enemy can throw at you that you and Jesus can't knock it down. Amen. How do you do it? Use your faith. <clears throat> if you've got a particular problem in your life, don't get up in the morning and say, Lord, bless me today. Get up in the morning and say, Lord, take, help me to lay down my anger today. Help me to lay down my greed today. Help me to lay down my hatred today and my unforgiveness today. Get up and specifically tell God what you want. Amen. Come on. And it's not for God's sake. God knows what you need. It's for your sake. So that you can release your faith for all those things that are on your... Everybody has a list. Amen. We can walk in Jesus Christ to the point that the blessings of God the grace of God flow out from us to the world around us because of who lives in us today. Mm -hmm. Amen. 